session in our series of the truth about homosexuality and transgenderism. And I am Dr. Renee Boyce. I'm going to be your presenter this evening. The purpose of my presentation really is to get you to think, to highlight some terms and to in your own mind begin to think about what will your response be or what is your response as individuals and what is our response as the church. So as we begin, let us pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to meet. We're not meeting in the traditional sense of meeting as we knew it in years past, but we thank you for technology and for advancements. We ask your guidance over everything that will go on tonight on this platform. We pray for the glorification of your name, for the edification of your people. And I pray that what is said and done, God, brings you glory, that it brings you glory, that you are the one who is glorified as a result of what goes on here this evening. Bless us as we proceed in Jesus' name. Amen. And for those of you who are just joining in and don't know who I am, I am Dr. Boyce, Dr. Renee Boyce. I am a member of the Church of God at Jackson. And my presentation this evening, the third installment, I believe, is transgenderism and its impact on society. So as we begin, I am going to share my screen or have my screen shared. Thank you, thank you so very much. And let's jump right into this. So two bits of housekeeping. One, I'm at home presently and I have a dog who doesn't like things that move at night or during the day for that matter. So I apologize for his behavior if you happen to hear him in the background doing his job as guard dog. I can't do anything about the crickets. And then the other piece of housekeeping is that we respect each other's opinions as we go through this presentation. We're not fully aware of all the persons who are online. And as we normally do as people of the Church of God, we will continue to love and respect the opinions of others, love others and respect their opinions. So let's begin. All right, so what we're going to do tonight, we're going to start off with definitions. If we have definitions of the different terms we're going to use during this presentation, it will help with our general understanding of what follows after these definitions. And then we're going to look at three specific sections of society. Namely, we're going to look at education, we're going to look at the family, and we're going to look at health. And health is wide and varied. So we're just going to take three little bits out of health, and we're going to look at the social well being. We're going to take a look at physical health. And throughout the presentation, even although there is a specific section on mental and emotional health, there will be references to mental and emotional health. Karl Marx said that society does not consist of individuals. It expresses, but expresses the sum of interrelations, the relations within which these individuals stand and the ultimate test of a moral society. And it's interesting that Karl Marx said moral. Um, he is the one to whom uh, communism is attributed. So the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. The world we have today, somebody left it to us. The decisions that were made impact on us today. And therefore, by extension, the decisions that we make today, what we allow and what we disallow, what we choose to believe, what we don't believe, all of these things will determine the kind of world that we will leave to our children.
So let's start with our definitions. What is a society? A society is a group of people in an ordered community. So we're speaking about some sort of structure. There must be something that allows for this order in a particular community. And a society consists of person, persistent, sorry, social interaction. So this isn't a one-off interaction. So I don't just go down the gap and I meet somebody and we belong to a society. It's that persistent social interaction that defines society. We must share the same space or territory and must be under the same political authority and dominant cultural expectations. So as you can see, I've highlighted some words. There's order. We must share the same space or territory. There is some authority, political authority, and there are some expectations culturally. So our next definition is that of gender. What is gender? And simply put, this is a social construct, meaning that this has to do with different, different roles in that are, that are made up culturally, social and cultural roles. So if we go back to prehistoric times, it was the role of the male to go out and hunt food. And it was the role of the female to stay in the cave and cook and look after the children. Over time, those roles have changed in that we now have females going out and becoming major breadwinners in families. And we have males who stay at home. So there is some shifting of the roles, but strictly speaking, we still hold fast to two genders, male and female. And those particular roles, we consider them to be either appropriate for men. So male, that male gender is appropriate for men. And that female gender is appropriate for women. So we move on now to what defines a woman or a man or what creates a sex. And this foundation, this is important so that we understand what is to come later. So sex is defined by the different biological or physiological characteristics. So these things are tangible as it were. So your reproductive organs and your sex, secondary sexual um, characteristics. So males, that would be the development of facial hair, hair on the chest, penis, testes, scrota. And for females, the presence of ovaries, a uterus, um, lips, outer lips, labium majorum, and smaller lips, menorah, and a clitoris. So these are the things and the development of breasts after the onset of puberty. And this is from the Council of Europe. So we inherit our genes from our parents. And each of us has 46, 23 from each parent. You get half from your father, half from your mother. What really differentiates what makes us male and female will be the sex chromosomes. So if you have two Xs, you're female. And if you have an X and a Y, that makes you male. So that determines those sexual, secondary sexual characteristics that make the man and the XX would determine those characteristics that make the female. But in life, not everything is perfect. So you can get some abnormalities in how the cells divide. And therefore, instead of having a female who has XX, she can end up with XXX. Or if you have a male, he can end up with XXY because there hasn't been complete separation of the sex chromosomes. But these things are not the most common, one in every thousand. Okay, let's go on. So this is to provoke your thinking. Earlier this year, there was the launch of the National LGBTI Survey Report in Barbados, and this would have been under the auspices of USAID, our institution of learning, the University of the West Indies, a social group here in Barbados, Equals, and the United Nations Development Project. 
And this was under the topic or under the heading UNDP being LGBTI in the Caribbean Regional Project. The survey was carried out in Barbados between December, November, December 2022 and into January 2023. And in July 2023 was when we had the launch of this um, the survey report. And these are the key features from that survey report. Those persons who were surveyed, nearly 17% of them experienced violence within the previous 12 months. Notably, 70%, 70%, seven out of the 10 had suicidal ideation and 24%, nearly a quarter of them made attempts on their lives. And what the persons who looked at the data and formulated the report thought was that these results showed that we need to dismantle discrimination and that we need to ensure equal rights and opportunities regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. So when we get to our question and answer and discussion section, this is something that we can have a conversation about. So this is just to get you thinking. So, Let's take a look at transgenderism and its impact on education. Our educational system right now seems to be under fire. Uh, every week, there seems to be some other, some other concern going on within the Ministry of Education or something happening in one of our schools. So what are the things that we believe are impacted or could potentially be impacted by transgenderism as we move on. First of all, we're gonna have an alteration in what our children are being taught. We send our children to school to learn. If we don't want to send them to school to learn, we're going to have to be involved in home schooling. And the way our lives are, I don't think that there are many of us right now who will be able to homeschool our children. And it's not a very popular concept here in Barbados as yet. Perhaps this can be one of the impacts of transgenderism where people will now opt to take on the responsibility of instructing their children at home because of the things that are being taught in school. Now, let me go back to years ago. I date myself by saying that I went to primary school in the 80s. And I distinctly remember that at primary school, we were told that a family consists of a mother, the definition of a nuclear family was a mother, a father, and a child or children. The extended family would have been the inclusion of grandparents, aunts and uncles, the single parent or family, single parent family, either mother or father and child or children. But the definition of family has taken on a whole new concept where we now have families with two fathers or families with two mothers. And this is what our children are being taught in schools now. I am thinking back to my own children when they were doing the family and the definition still stood up to that point in time, I think this was two years ago that the family was being done by one of my children. And this was still the definition of the family, but the definition will change. The definition has changed in some other countries. And we're going to see in the literature that the definition will change. Some of the other things that are being altered or changed as we have our children in schools is we're not going to have a conflict between what is taught in homes and what is taught in schools. My son recently entered secondary school and I said to him, you are a boy. Do not let anybody tell you differently. And my daughter, she's in fifth form now. And I didn't, I didn't have that conversation with her about saying to her, you are a girl, don't let anybody tell you differently. But it has become so prominent now that we have to make sure that we anchor our children in those things that we have as our beliefs. So the problem is for people like me who like marks and who like to get things right, 
for me to lose a mark for writing what I believe or for a paper that I submit or an essay a child has to write and this essay is going to be marked down because the correct answer is not what I was taught to believe, it's not what the word of God says, this is going to have an impact on the qualifications that our children can achieve in the future. This marks the difference between a pass, a merit, and a distinction. And these are things that are important to, to people. And therefore, this is one of the impacts of transgenderism, the value of the education and the actual teaching that our children are getting. Now, we admit that with new knowledge comes change. And we go back to my primary school days. I remember one of my, my class three teacher, we were doing weather. And the thinking back in that time was if the temperature in the world had exceeded 30 degrees Celsius, we would all die. That was the thinking back in the day. Certainly, the temperatures have exceeded 30 degrees Celsius. And thankfully, we have not died. Well, some people have died because of the heat, but the vast majority of persons are still surviving in the heat. So we admit, yes, with new knowledge must come change. And society, even although there are certain um, boundaries that create a society, there must be change. A society must evolve. The question we need to ask ourselves is, is this current trend beneficial to us as a society, to us as individuals, to us as a nation, because we have some national problems because of transgenderism, which we will discuss as we go on. Now, one of the other areas that's going to be impacted or has already been impacted is the classroom environment. Discipline is conducive to a productive learning environment. And we have all heard from the teachers, and I'm sure the teachers who are online are nodding their heads, is that quite a bit of the time that they have to do actual instruction for their classes, they need to settle the classes down. Time has to be taken for the class to be settled. Now, I remember on last week's presentation, one of the young ladies who spoke we were speaking at that time about the erosion of the male as a head, the loss of the male gender. And she had spoken about hairstyles and the difficulty that you have at present trying to figure out the difference between who's male and who's female and some of the, the hairstyles that the males were, were wearing. And I actually do remember that I came across a child who could not have been in more than infants A. And he had extensions on his hair as he was on his way to school. And this is, this is becoming the norm. So we already have the issue of hairstyles. Let's bring in the issue of wearing uniforms of the opposite sex. Or remember that the classroom environment is not only consisting of teachers, of, of students, the, the boys and girls in the classroom, or the men and women in the classroom, but it also consists of the teachers, the one providing the instruction. So if we have transgender teachers who choose to dress in the opposite sex, we can see how this will impact on the classroom environment. And I have a few pictures to show you as we go on. This was taken from the internet and this, these pictures show some students on a gender swap day. And right in the middle of the pictures would be the teacher who is wearing a purple evening gown to come to school to teach. Next slide. And this is just another group of students who were involved in a gender swap day. Just, just take a look. And I think my comment for this is when America sneezes, Barbados catches a cold. All right, so next slide. Now logistics, so we've spoken about classroom environment. Let's talk about logistics, simple things that we take for granted. granted. You know, you are in your class 
and you say a child puts up his or her hand and you say yes sir or you say yes ma'am or you know sometimes when we're trying to empower the children we say to them we say to them um sir or mr so and so or miss so and so in an effort to give them to empower them to get them to understand that you know this this you need to take this seriously you're not coming here to idle so this is a case where a professor loses his tenure because he said yes sir a student an obviously male student raised his hand in a lecture and he said yes sir and that was the start of a lawsuit because that particular student identified as a female even although he was dressed as a male. I'm not certain how the professor was supposed to know that he identified as a female whilst he was dressed as a male, but this went to the school board. And when the professor refused to retract saying yes, sir, to somebody who's obviously male physically, he was, he was sued. It went to the law courts. He lost his job. And I think after six rounds in court, he was reinstated. But this is going to become the norm. This is going to become the norm. We're going to be walking on eggshells with simple things like referring to students. Let's talk about bathroom usage. And I'm sure it's fresh in, fresh in your mind where we had the issue with the query gender neutral bathroom sign. Now the current teaching for students in the US and Canada with respect to bathroom usage is that they should use the bathroom that is gender affirming. Therefore, if you are male, but you identify as female, then you should use the female bathroom because that is the one that affirms your gender. So let's put a scenario. I am not sure how gender neutral bathrooms are constructed. I'm not sure if the urinal is in open space as it is in a normal male bathroom. And therefore, is it going to be a case where the urinal is in the open space, so the transgender male is going to use the urinal whilst they're females who are using that bathroom as well. So somebody comes out to wash their hands, are they going to see someone with a penis who identifies as female using the urinal? These are questions we have to ask ourselves. So therefore, this has a ripple effect on the construction of new buildings, the construction of new schools. I'm not sure how the gender neutral bathrooms are built or, or whether the, there's not going to be need for a urinal anymore. They're just going to be toilets and the transgender um, females will just have to lift the seat. We don't know. But in the same way they are told to use the bathroom which most affirms their gender, they're saying, well, wear the uniform which best expresses your gender identity. And I'm not sure how many of you remember where there was a student at one of our schools who was, where there was an issue with him as a male, so he would be transgender female, who wanted to wear a girl's uniform, but it was not being allowed by the school. And something else that we take for granted is forms. When our children go into schools, there are several forms that we have to fill out. And one of them will be the area of gender. What is your gender? Male, female. So do you tick male or female, but that you identify as female or you identify as male? How are we going to solve these problems? Next. Now, this picture um, is as a result of a scenario in a US school where this teacher, male, in the year prior to when this picture was taken, he was transitioning to female and there was some conflict. And therefore, he opted to express his right to be female by wearing oversized prosthetic breasts to school. 
I think they said this was a size Z. I didn't even know that Z, was it Z? I think somebody said Z, I wasn't sure. Um, but yes, wearing these oversized prosthetic breasts. Now, interestingly enough, this class is woodwork. And you now maybe go back to roles and the way we thought about roles. If you think about it, most of the woodwork teachers were, were male. So this is another shift in, in the, the gender, in the gender, in the roles that are being performed because we do have woodwork teachers who are female and there is nothing wrong with a woodwork teacher being female. We've, we've passed that as, as a people. But the issue here is the controversy between his choice to express himself in this fashion in school. So we go back to the good book. What does the Bible say? We have to bear in mind that children are impressionable with minds like sponges. Children take in things and the younger they are, the more they take in. Somebody had said that children are being used as props in the transgender storytelling in adult lives. And that's an interesting thought. But what does it say in the Bible? Well, let's go back to the good book, Colossians 2.8. See to it, i.e., it is your responsibility, and for those who have children under their care, it is your responsibility to see that no one takes you or those in your under your control. And I use that word control very lightly, that they take you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. And this philosophy is dependent on human tradition and importantly, elemental spiritual forces of this world. This philosophy, these philosophies are not dependent on Christ. They don't come from Christ. They, they don't come from God. And the important thing here is that they're captive. They take us, they, they, they send out uh, a lane, as it were, hook, lane and sinker, we're taken in by these philosophies. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we are informed and that those who are in our charge are also informed so that we don't become captivated by these different philosophies. So we're going to look now at society, different sections in society. What comes out of the family is what goes into society. So the problems that we see in society, and this is generally speaking, the problems we see in society is as a result of those things that go on in various households. So we see a child misbehaving in school, that's something that has come out of that particular household. We see crime and violence in the nation. Those are things that have come out of particular households and they have, they have woven their way into society. So let's see how transgenderism impacts on society. Language, I love words. I love language. I usually get a new word every day. The, the LGBTQ plus vocabulary is extensive. This is just a snapshot of some of the terms under G, and this is not all of the terms under G. Gender euphoria, gender expansive, gender expression, gender identity, gender neutral, gender non-conforming, gender performance theory. And in an effort to try to understand all of these things, I got a headache so many times during this presentation. I will willingly admit that I got a headache. But one of the things that's going to change is the language that is being used. And whilst the words are the same, because we do use gender, we do use euphoria, but we put those words together, it means something completely different. It takes on a completely different meaning, which has the potential, if misused, to offend different sectors of society. So. One of the things that we're going to have to be looking out for is the new language that's being used. And somebody is going to say, because remember for everything that we say on one side with respect to transgenderism, 
somebody on the other side can say, well, language has changed from time immemorial. We don't use thee and thou and thus any longer. Well, well except you read the King James Version or you read things like um, Shakespeare and so on, but gender changes. And yes, that is true. So I don't know that we're going to be able to stem the tide of this new syntax of, of uh, vocabulary, this new set of words. Next. I had gotten an email from one of my lecturers a couple of years ago. And at the bottom of the letter, I noticed she signed her name and then she wrote she and her. And that's the first time I had seen it. And then I recognized that what she was saying by signing she and her was that she identified as female. And these are just some of the pronouns. This is, this is just a few, he, she, they, z, here, per, it. And interestingly enough, we were just talking about language. When you are doing presentations and so on, you're using Microsoft Word. If you misspell a word or a word that is not in the dictionary or in the Microsoft dictionary, it flags it as an error. Do you get the red squiggly line under that word z and here? are still flagged as incorrect spellings, even although they are words which are used in the vocabulary in the transgender world. Somebody made a comment that transgenderism is becoming a social contagion. And if we go back to that sad period in our lives here as a nation where we had suicide after suicide after suicide, there is such a thing as social contagion because some things give people courage. So if other persons were brave enough or they, they behave in a particular way and they were able to do it, well then perhaps so can I. And transgenderism is becoming a social contagion where persons are becoming more, more bold, more outspoken and we are a very tolerant society here in Barbados. We are a very tolerant and docile society. And we tend to mutter under our collective breath as a nation. So something offends us for two reasons, I think we ought not to speak out. One, because of the nature of being Barbadian and being docile. And so we're going to get together in our little groups and we're going to quarrel and so on. And also because it has become increasingly violent and harmful to speak out in society because nobody wants to get an unlucky blow. Nobody wants to get part of their body cut off with a Collins or nobody wants six holes in their chest as a result of speaking out against something. But this is something that we're going to have to decide. Are we going to speak out or are we not? One of the things that's going to happen is that uh, this is going to have an increase in the incidence and prevalence of mental health disorders. Prevalence is like a snapshot, how many cases there are at a particular point in time. Incidence would be the occurrence of new cases. And we recently celebrated World Mental Health Day, I believe two days ago. And some of the mental health disorders that are seen are depression, that overwhelming sadness. And depression can lead to suicidal ideation and that can go on to suicide. And we can also have an increase in anxiety disorders. Can also have increased violence. I spoke about violence against those persons who were speaking out against transgenderism and things which went against their beliefs. So within the transgender community itself, there is violence because they're very, very high emotions within the transgender communities. But because of the difference within this community, or sorry, between the transgender community and the other, the other, I don't want to use the word normal in an effort not to offend. So let's say non-transgender and transgender communities. So you tend to have violence between these two communities because of the differing belief systems. 
And then children become victims of bullying on cyberspace. This is why we as adults, we have to be so careful of what our children are watching. Children are growing up in an age where they are being raised by technology. So we are busy in the house and the easiest thing to do is to give the toddler a tablet and let them watch a cartoon or something. But we have to be so careful because even the cartoons that our children are watching are infiltrated with things in the realm of transgenderism. Pictures that are labeled as child safe. I remember I was watching a cooking show, cooking, and it was labeled as uh, the age was 13 plus. And I thought to myself, so, so why, why, why do we have to put an age on a cooking show? A cooking show should be something that everybody in the family can sit down and watch. Oh no, that thing was littered with swear words. So we have to be careful what our children watch. And we know of cases where children are being bullied both here in Barbados and in the, in the US and the other uh, first world countries or the larger countries in the world on cyberspace. But not only in the area of the internet. Oh, and the other things, they're not only victims of bullying, but they become victims to persons who want to influence them to become transgender, and this is a thing. They also become victims of um, those who want to prey on them. So we have to be so very careful with our children. The children also become victims of bullying in communities and at school. Children are brutally honest by virtue of being children. And they have to be trained how to say, what to say, when to say it. But sometimes children can be very, very mean intentionally. And those children who, for example, let's say a child sucked his or her fingers and their teeth were pushed out as a result of sucking their fingers. They can get called buff, buff teeth. They can get called Bugs Bunny and all sorts of things. So children are inherently unkind at times. So can you imagine now a child who decides in a society that's predominantly non-transgender, a child who decides that he or she is going to come out as transgender, a little girl who is going to identify as male, this child is going to be the victim of bullying more than likely. Now, I read a study that said at about 18 months, children can become aware of whether they're male or female. And by age five, five years, seven months or so, not or so, children know whether or not they want to be transgender. And certainly by teenage years, they are fully convinced and are already making preparations and acting socially in, in the opposite gender. So this is another thing that we have to be aware of as we are watching our children transition from infant to toddler, to preschool, to child, to adolescent and into adulthood. So much of what children do can be experimentation, but it's not always experimentation. I do remember that there was a discussion with a child who was actually um, having relationships with both males and females. And this could be seen as experimentation, a child who's uncertain of who she is and trying to find her way in this world of so many things that you, know, you don't know where to go, what to do. This is becoming the norm or this is being accepted as normal. So perhaps I can try this. Perhaps these feelings that I'm having at this particular point in time are, are correct or right. We don't know. And one of, I remember having a discussion at a rehearsal. We were just chit chatting whilst we were waiting. And sometimes our children are unaware of what is going on. And the person who was giving the story relayed that she was involved in a particular sport and one of the persons there was known to be, a, I, I believe a lesbian, I'm not sure transgender or lesbian, nevertheless, and was fielding questions towards this 
unknowing young female in an effort to feel her out to see whether or not she would become a lesbian as well. So sometimes our children are innocent, they're vulnerable. And remember I said earlier that our children are sponges and they just take in. So if there's something missing in the home, if there's something our children don't have, they become easy prey for adults who are willing to give them what they want. So this is something we need to be aware of as parents. Now, I'm not a lawyer. Reading contracts and those things, it's almost as bad as reading the King James Version, right? So complicated, hitherto and forthwith, henceforth and so on. But we're just going to put our toes into the legal system. The Barbados' Sexual Offenses Act of 1992 said that if you were found guilty of buggery, that you were um, given up to life imprisonment. And if there was serious indecency, well, you got up to 10 years, but in 2022, this was decriminalized consensual same-sex relations. So if you do rape somebody, that's still an offense, but consensual, meaning that both parties agree, consensual same-sex relations in 2022, that was decriminalized. So the next question we can ask ourselves will be what is, what you can go forward, what is the next thing that is going to be decriminalized or should I say legalized? That's for your thoughts. But this is just the response from the LGBTQ plus to the decriminalization of that Sexual Offenses Act. We're very pleased with the result of this case, which is a result of years of advocacy efforts by community organizations, as well as the litigants. This is the step where, in the right direction for the protection of LGBTQ plus people in Barbados, as we continue to ensure stigma-free access to services and positive inclusion in society. This is the continuation of visible, monumental, and transformative work to remove misleading ideas about the LGBTQ plus community in Barbados and by extension across the Caribbean. Next steps have to be focused on gender identity recognition. This outcome creates opportunities to address other issues our community faces and a chance to rectify those challenges. So I put my question back out there again. What is the next thing that we're going to see? Uh, what, what was used? Um, creating an opportunity to address other issues. So what is the next issue that's going to be addressed and what is going to be rectified? I have an idea in my head. We can talk about that when we go down a little further. Next. Now let's take a look at sports. The reason you get involved in sports would be for the pleasure of doing it because your doctor has said, for example, that you need to maybe lose some weight or you need to condition your heart and, or your mental health practitioner has said to you, well, perhaps sports is a good way for you to manage this depression or anxiety. So we, we get involved in sports for different reasons. The majority of people get involved in the sport because they want to excel at it because they want the praise. The millions of dollars that people pay for a footballer is mind blowing. So there is reason for you to get involved in the sport and therefore you would want to do anything to, to be able to win, to be able to be the first person in that particular sport, which is why people get involved in doping and all other sorts of things uh, in order to win a particular prize, in order to win. As a matter of fact, I think one of the funniest things I will always remember, I was doing a discussion on, I was involved in a discussion on doping and so on. And one of the comments, he relayed his experience where there was, a gentleman who they found out was pregnant. And the reason he was pregnant is because he was using a banned substance. So what he did was to use his girlfriend's urine 
as his urine, but he didn't know that his girlfriend was pregnant. And that is how he discovered that they were pregnant. All right, so clearly he was uh, disqualified, but um, we're going to come back to that. I'm very glad that that popped into my thoughts because we're going to come to that shortly. So we know that people do things in order to win. Now, Michael Phelps, he was an Olympic swimmer. Now he's into writing books and doing motivational speaking and so on. He's very tall. He's six foot four and he has a wingspan that means the distance from the top of his middle finger on the left to the right is six feet, seven inches. His wingspan is taller than most people. And so at one point in time, they thought he had a connective tissue disorder called Marfan syndrome. And people were thinking that this gave him a competitive advantage. Well, subsequently he was tested and so on. He didn't have Marfan syndrome. So he was fortunate in that he was genetically engineered to have an advantage as a swimmer. Now, consider a transgender female in swimming. So a transgender female is a male who identifies as female or, and who may have had the sex change to go from um, male to female. So typically speaking, males are stronger they tend to be taller, not all men are tall, not all men are stronger, but we're talking generally. So we, we can usually identify males as, you know, having the broader shoulders, the more muscular structure. So put that in a sport like swimming, of course they're going to have the advantage. So the females can train and train and train and train and they can bulk up as much as they can, but a male in swimming would tend to have the advantage. So the question is, can we talk about fairness in sports now? Can we talk about fairness in sports? And there's another sport as well that has become the subject of much dismay. Next slide. Cycling. This particular cyclist, a transgender cyclist, this was a race in New York City. Tiffany Thomas, who was born a male. And I like the way that the Daily Mail put it ended the Randall's Island Crit cycling race atop the podium. So Tiffany came first, blowing the competition out of the water to snatch first place. Now, is it T Tiffany's um, days of practicing and skill? Or is it that Tiffany is male? Yes, I'm going to say Tiffany is is male. So it's so so challenging. Tiffany was born male and therefore genetically male and therefore more muscular and stronger. Who knows if that gave Tiffany the competitive advantage over the other females who are born female and are still identifying as female? So fairness in sport, this is something that is an ongoing debate. And this is something that is going to continue. The question is going to be sometime down the road, are we going to have a particular category therefore? So we're going to have the men's four by one, the women's four by one, the, the female transgender, the male transgender four by one, who knows what's going to happen in the future in order to level the playing field for sport again. Next. So we go back to the Bible. Anytime you need clarity, you go back to the Bible. Genesis 1, 27 to 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. You know, in your minds, you're hearing be fruitful and multiply because that's how we learned it as children. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is the foundation. This is what God said in the beginning. But what do we have occurring now? Next. One purpose of having males and females is procreation. Pro means for. 
creation is the action or process of bringing something into existence. Therefore, procreation means for bringing something into existence. Two males cannot procreate. Two females cannot procreate. However, transgender persons can procreate once there has not been gender affirming surgery. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Next. All right, so this is the current state of affairs. I've just given you the foundation of what God created, right? So next. This is a transgender couple. So what you're seeing in the picture is the transgender male as evidenced by the facial hair, beard and mustache. The transgender male is pregnant. This is the one wearing the gray shirt that says, this is what trans looks like. So the question we ask ourselves now, this fetus, what are the potential side effects to the fetus with the drugs? Because we know that this transgender male, i.e. a female who has taken drugs and had surgeries to look like a male, has to take drugs. So what's the potential side effect? So we know that there's somebody that's going to say there is a list of drugs which are uh, regulated drugs which are taken for whatever reason, which can be harmful to the fetus. Yes. So there was a study that I came across where they were looking at the outcomes of transgender infants or, like, or births. But the study had significant limitations. For example, they were only looking at successful pregnancies. They were looking to see the effects of the um, gender affirming hormonal therapies on the fetus. But the study only looked at the, those pregnancies which were successful. So they didn't look at the couples who had failure um, of conceiving and they didn't look at those who would have lost pregnancies in the first trimester, second or third trimester. And therefore there is, as the study quoted, a paucity of information with respect to the effects of these drugs on the fetus. And there needs to be more studying done. So that's a question for us. What, what, are, what are we doing to the fetuses? Next. Will there be breastfeeding? We here in Barbados, the, the hospital, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is a breastfeeding hospital where breastfeeding is promoted and the World Health Organization agrees that breast is best and so on. So will there be breastfeeding? So somebody is going to ask the question, why is this an issue in transgenderism? Because there are females who are unable to breastfeed for whatever reason. Uh, perhaps they're HIV positive and it's not recommended that they breastfeed. Perhaps they have inverted nipples or perhaps it's just their decision to not breastfeed. So there are persons who can feel those questions. So this is just another question we can ask. You know, Are you giving the child the best advantage? Because we do know that those children who are breastfed tend to be better academically. They tend to be less at risk for things like asthma and the other communicable diseases as they get older, they, they tend to not be obese or overweight. So are we setting up this child for sickness and failure? And lastly, will the child be the subject of bullying? So your father was pregnant with you? That is a setup for, for bullying if ever there was one. But Perhaps it might not be a setup for bullying because that might be the, the norm or something that's just, oh, okay, that's part of society now. Next. And this is just another picture. This is a transgender male who became pregnant by his drag queen partner. This is the world in which we live. We need to be aware of these things. Next. All right, so what's going to happen with us as a society? On the left, this is the population pyramid for Barbados in 2010. Left in the diagram, this is blue for the males, yellow for the females. And I like the idea that it is blue and yellow. So what we can see 
is at the top, that's the oldest persons in you know, the ages from 80 up to 100. And down at the bottom, those are the children ages zero to about 18. And in the middle, we have our, um, the persons that are able to work, our workforce. We have our workforce in the middle. Now, if you look at the shape of the pyramid on the left, we have a nice wide-ish workforce there in 2010. But let's step across to 2020 on the right. What has happened to the workforce? That workforce, those persons there between the ages of 20 and 50, that has gone down considerably. And relatively speaking, we are seeing that the older population is increasing. So what are the consequences of this shift in population structure where we are having a decrease in the number of children who are being born because you know males and males can't procreate and females and females can't procreate either we have a declining number of children and children become adults so if we have fewer children then we're going to have fewer adults we have declining numbers in the workforce and i'm sure we are all fully aware that it is the workforce that is taxed and therefore a declining workforce has implications for two things, greater taxes for those persons who are still working and a decrease in the amounts that are put into the social services such as NAS and all the other, and pay as you earn and the other things which are um, in, into which the money that we work for are put. So we have this increased dependency on already stretched resources. And therefore, to solve the problem now, we're going to have to increase our numbers of population through emigration. So we don't take lightly transgenderism because the impacts, they're like the roots of a tree. They're, they're hidden, but they're far reaching. Hidden, but they are far reaching. Next. Let's talk about relationship goals. And we had this conversation just last week. Uh, we had mention of this. Now, when, when I was younger, when we spoke about pig in a blanket, we were talking about, um, we, we would have these big arguments in the national youth sections, uh, sessions about, um, you know, how, how can you marry a pig in the blanket? So this previously referred to not trying out sexual com compatibility before marriage. But no, your, your question, isn't going to be, um, were you a virgin or not? Your question has to be, were you born male or female? That's the first question. I was actually talking to someone in the office yesterday and I said to her, you know, you're young and when you're thinking about getting into a relationship, hi, hi on your list, <laughs> what is your name? Oh, nice to meet you. Uh, were you born a male? That, that has got to be the way you go down the road because if you go down the road and you become invested in this relationship and then a year down the road, you know, you've invested money, invested emotions, invested plans that may not have been known to the other person. And then next thing you know, well, you hear, <laughs> well, you know, I had me some surgery and I was a female, but I'm male now. And we heard this comment last week from our presenter where he never thought he would have competition from the opposite sex for the opposite sex, but it is something that is real. You, you have to be on the lookout now to make sure that the person that you have your eye on, some person of the same sex doesn't have his, well, their eye on that person. And then it comes right back to the issue of procreation, the agenda to undermine everything that God had created for the purposes that he created those things. And these two handsome men, men here, these are transgender males. They were born female, but these are both uh, popular stars. And again, a warning to us as parents and those who sit as watchmen on the walls, where do our children get their sources of inspiration from? From where do they get their inspiration who did they want to be like? You know, you want to be popular. And if this is what popular looks like, then perhaps I need to become this in order to be popular. 
So a lot of work has to go into us as parents and watchmen on the wall. So even if you don't have a child or, or children, you still have nieces and nephews, or you still have children in your neighborhood and children in your church. So there must be some child upon whom you can exert a positive influence. And we have a serious responsibility for our children to be on our knees before God, for them to keep bombarding heaven for the safety of our children. And, and now it's not only the physical safety, but their emotional health becomes so important. And the next picture is a gorgeous female. This is Lena Bloom, who is the first transgender female to grace the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous person. Yes, she was born as a male and began transitioning, I believe, in her teens. Yes, and she continues to be a model on the Sports Illustrated um, magazine. All right, so we are moving on to our last component, and we're going to look at health. I think one of the things that was well done by the World Health Organization, and several things were well done by the World Health Organization, but this definition of health, an absolutely brilliant definition, I think. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and I like to add spiritual and financial and emotional and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And this definition allows for discussion because you can easily ask yourself the question, can you achieve a state of complete anything? So can you be completely well? Because even if you go physically, because even, even if you go to the doctor and you do your blood work and you are the perfect weight and so on, your blood pressure is absolutely normal, your blood sugar, everything is wonderful. Nobody knows of that one cell that is beginning to multiply. So for all intents and purposes, you are not completely well physically. So it's a very, very good definition, good for discussion and, and good for understanding health itself, because you do have to have a definition. So we are going to take our look in this final section at transgenderism and its impact on health. Now let's look at social well-being. Now we are created with a sense of belonging. We want to belong, we want to fit in. It's very difficult to be the ones on the fringes of society that stand out for whatever reason, the, the homeless, those persons who are transgender or varying sexualities, the poor, those persons who are physically disabled and those persons who are mentally challenged. Everybody wants to fit in. It is not easy being different. I remember on Sesame Street, Kermit the Frog sang a song and he spoke about it not being easy being green. He was, he was green. Other people were different colors. You know, it was instructive in the sense that they were teaching colors, but now that I think about it with my adult mind and my adult eyes, it speaks about being different from somebody else. Sesame Street was really good. Nevertheless, let's look back at our uh, definition of society. Order community, we're in the same space, same political authority and same dominant cultural expectations. So therefore, these persons that sit outside the norm for whatever reason, they will have a lack of social well-being and social well-being or a lack of social well-being comes with so many different problems. Let's take for instance, getting a job for whatever reason you're unable to get a job let's say the particular particular requirements would be that you've never had an issue with mental health because perhaps this job is a high stress job and so on and you might present triggers and so on and that spirals down into your inability to get a job and therefore your disposable income is going to be decreased and then your disposable income is decreased and you can't support yourself you can't support your children and therefore, you're going to end up losing your home. You're going to end up being homeless. And the cycle just keeps going around. Next. 
So those persons who are transgender are still on the fringes of society. Remember the two comments that we looked at after the persons, after the law had been changed about um, the criminal, not criminal offenses, the sexual offenses act of 1992. Um, after it had been changed, they spoke about equal opportunities for transgender persons because the truth is they are victims of stigma and discrimination. The difference between stigma and discrimination, stigma would be the perception, the, the way you think about a particular thing, the ideas, stereotypes, discrimination would be the behaviors that, that come out of this stigma. And therefore, let's take for instance, um, let's say my attitude to a transgender person is that I, I just, I, I think that they're weird. This is just an example. Mind you, I'm just let me put that out there. This person is weird. Why would this person want to go and they're born a male and they want to put on dresses? And that's that's my thoughts, that's my stereotype. And the discrimination is that if I see them, I cross the other side of the street. Does that sound like any Bible stories of which we are aware? These persons are victims of violence, and we mentioned this earlier in the presentation, violence within the transgender community, but also violence from without the transgender community. And we can think of some other uh, Caribbean islands where homosexuality, for example, is something that's almost, uh, if you wear that on your sleeve, you are asking to be killed. And they're also likely to be excluded from different things. But the big problem with transgenderism is that they have challenges accessing healthcare and they're not the only ones in society who have challenges accessing healthcare. The elderly have challenges ex accessing healthcare simply by virtue of transportation, failing memories, failing eyesight, having illnesses that they themselves are not able to manage properly. And therefore they're not able to get to the places they need to get to in order to access healthcare. But what happens is that those persons, because of the issues of being on the fringes and outside of society, they tend to have poor health. And already these are persons who are on multiple drugs. These are persons who've had surgeries and do need healthcare. Next, and this was from the Lancet 2016. I made mention of this quote about children being used as props. So back between 2013 and 2020, over a seven year span. Interestingly, the number seven, in the USA and Canada, 317 children between the ages of three and 12, they were part of this trans youth project where they socially transitioned, meaning that if you were a little girl, you would start wearing boy clothing and you would act like a boy. So you would choose to do the more male sports. If it was the other way around, if you were a trans girl, you would go to gymnastics and so on. What they found was that 2.5%, by the time they were five years old, went back to the gender that they were assigned at birth. But 60%, by the time they were in their teens, were convinced that their gender was wrong and they were taking gender affirming hormones to become the gender with which they would have subsequently chosen to identify. Next. Let's look at mental health. And as I mentioned two days ago, we celebrated World Mental Health Day. Now, they also found out that in those children, there was a higher incidence of mental health disorders, such as autism and um, attention hyperactivity deficit disorder. Those children tended to have, or, or those children already came with the mental health disorders. And then subsequently, those children developed mental health disorders. And they found that there were higher rates of suicide and suicide attempts than in the average, there were higher attempts, higher rates than in the average person, in the transgender individual. So the transgender group had more incidents of suicide and suicide attempts. 
according to CNN, that's what they said, um, the National Institutes of Health, they said that 82% of the transgender youth considered suicide with 40% attempting, 40%, 40% attempting suicide. That is a problem. That is a problem. But what, what are your thoughts? Why do you think that these children would want to consider suicide and, and even more troubling attempt suicide? Next. I just wanna to touch on gender dysphoria. Now, according to the guideline for diagnosing mental health disorders, it's a marked incongruence between their experienced or expressed gender and the one they were assigned at birth. And it was previously termed gender identity disorder. So what it is, it's a conflict between the sex you were given at birth and the, and the gender that you identify with. So I was born a female and I reach a certain stage, usually seen in children and youth. It can also be seen in adults, but usually in the younger population. And I have decided that I cannot, at this time, I don't want to be a female anymore. I, I'm supposed to be male. And what this leads to would be things like relationship conflict. So conflict with parents and the child, interpersonal conflict, you and your peers, I would even go as far as saying intrapersonal conflict because you're conflicted within yourself. And we have issues with low self-esteem and we know out of low self-esteem comes vulnerability for those persons who don't have good intentions toward you. And then there's also self-harm and suicidal risk and attempts. So just for your knowledge, in order to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder, there must be a difference between the gender identity and the secondary sexual characteristics. So you can't have gender dysphoria if you are identifying as a female and you have breasts and a vagina. That's not gender dysphoria. That's maybe depression or something else a strong desire to be rid of the genitals. So you don't like these breasts. I don't like this penis. I need to get rid of them. And moreover, a strong desire to have the genitals of another. And you want to be treated as another gender. And additionally, you want to respond in a way you believe the other, the other gender would respond. So if we have a particular scenario, let's say I, I'm born female, no, I'm born male, and I have gender dysphoria, so I want to be a female. And there is a movie going on, and I believe that in this particular scene, the female would cry, I would cry, because that's what I believe a female would respond in a particular situation. So, and you have to have these symptoms going on for six months in order to make the diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Because remember, I spoke about experimentation. Yes, something outside has moved. My apologies. All right, next. So let's talk about physical health. Uh, in order to transition from, from male to female or the other way around, you have to use um, these exogenous hormones, hormones that you take into the body. And we know that each drug, I, well, I would always remember from a medical school, when you take a drug, the drug does something to the body and the body does something to the drug. And that's the way drugs work. So every drug has potential side effects. Even those drugs we have listed as natural, some of the side effects are good. Many of the side effects are not good. So there are many unwanted side effects of these drugs and a simple thing like acne, for example, you know, you're taking um, testosterone, for example, you can get some acne and um, you're taking estrogen and you smoke, you're putting yourself at risk for increased risk for heart attacks and strokes and deep vein thromboses. 
And again, someone can come and say, but these are things that can happen with persons that are using the pill. And yes, we say, yes, we agree, but there are part of the transgender, um, the transgender transitioning. So these are things that can happen to persons who use testosterone and estrogen. And in order to get that look, because you know females tend to have this a rounder face, a softer look, and males tend to be more angular and, and, and harder. And therefore to get the looks, you have to have some facial surgery and you, you, know, you tweak how, you don't even know how I look doing that. And you tweak how persons look based on the surgery. And therefore, if you're going to have this gender affirming surgery as a female, you're moving to male, you're going to have to remove the female organs. So you're going to take out the uterus and the womb and you're going to create a penis and, um, and testes from the clitoris and the lips of the vagina. And for the male who's going the other way, you're going to create breasts and you're going to create a vagina from the penis and you're going to use the tip of the penis to create a clitoris. This is genital reconstruction surgery, which is one expensive tool. It's not that you go in today and you have your surgery and you spend six days in hospital and you're out. These are multiple procedures. They're complicated because you have to be sure that structures are put, I was going to say put back where they should be, but that's incorrect that when structures are placed in their new location, that they can still carry out the function for which they were created. And I'm speaking, let's talk about the urethra in males. The urethra is the tube that allows a man, allows anybody to, to pass urine. So if you're going to remove the penis, you're gonna to have to make sure that you relocate the urethra so that the female can still the transgender female can still urinate. Yes, that's it. And we're gonna talk about the, the side effects of this genital reconstruction surgery. So next slide, please. Now, principles of reaching a medical diagnosis. History, what the patient comes saying, I've had a cold for two weeks. How long? Um, and did you have a cough? Yes. How long did you have the cough? Was it a wet cough? Was it a dry cough? Is it preventing you from sleeping? Doc, I can't laugh because as soon as I laugh, I have this cough. Did you have a fever? Was there anybody else who around you had a cold? So this is the history. You know, you, you get information that brings you up to the current point. Then there's physical examination where you put your hand on the patient, in the case of telemedicine, where sometimes you ask the patient to point out and do some maneuvers. And then you do relevant investigations. So it's not that you throw any investigation at the, the patient. Let's go back to our patient who had a cold. You are not going to do an abdominal ultrasound on a patient who has come complaining of a cold. So it has to be relevant investigations. Now, in order to reach a medical diagnosis, now we have to ask, and we have to say, like if we're on ward rounds, for example, we have to say the assigned gender at birth. We have to think about gender specific illnesses. For example, you can only have cervical cancer if you have a cervix. You can only have prostate cancer if you have a prostate. So even although not every, even although um, persons are transgender, not everybody has had gender affirming surgery. So some person comes into hospital and they have a cold, for example, and you do a chest X-ray or they have a cold and weight loss and this productive cough and it prompts you to do a chest X-ray and you notice that they're um, what we call METs, metastases on the lungs. The question is, where are these metastases coming from? And, or is this primary lung disease? So you have a female, or what you think is a female, lying on the bed in front of you. And of course, this speaks to doing a proper physical examination because this could be a male who has prostate cancer that has spread to his lungs. So 
you have to be very, very careful about making sure you do a thorough physical exam. Um, part of my job entails doing medicals and on the form for the immigration medicals, years ago, I used to be very, very irritated about one thing on the form where it said genitals. And for the life of me, I could not understand why would it matter about the person's genitals and their immigration status? What does one have to do with the other? But now I am, I am taking that question back and it has to do with population statistics and, and whatever else. No, I'm sure back in the day when they had that on, they probably had other reasons for justifying looking at the patient's genitals. But perhaps now it becomes more relevant in the era of transgenderism. Who knows? And then another thing in medicine is screening tests. So in transgenderism, we still have to advise patients of the correct screening tests that they need to do. And therefore, if you haven't had gender affirming surgeries, you still need to screen for cervical cancer as a woman. You still need to screen for prostate cancer. Women would still need to have their mammograms. So screening tests become relevant still but you have to decide which screening tests are relevant to, to which population. And sometimes we make diagnoses according to gender risk. So let's say, for example, somebody comes into the accident and emergency with crushing chest pain, somebody who is male and they're in their late 40s, early 50s, hypertension. We're going to say that this could possibly be a heart attack. But that's not necessarily going to be your first diagnosis in, um, in a young female. So you could possibly miss a diagnosis in somebody if you are looking at gender risk for a particular condition. So these are things that need to be thought about. And let's look at the interpretation of results. Next slide. Here in Barbados, the values that we tend to use would be in a female, normal hemoglobin runs anywhere from about 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. And as expected in males, it's higher, 14 to 18. So a transgender female comes into the office and has a hemoglobin of 17. That is going to be flagged as abnormal because if it's not stated or discovered that the person was born male, which would make a hemoglobin of 17 normal, we're going to start investigating this female for possible pathologies of a high hemoglobin. Why is your hemoglobin high? So this is just an example. Uh, 17 is just a little higher than 16, but this is just an example to show you how we now have to go and reinterpret results based on the transgender of a particular individual. Next. Let's talk about rates, rates in medicine. So I think it was in France, a transgender female had gender affirming surgery, which means that she had um, her penis removed and created, well not completely removed, but made into a vagina, wanted a pelvic exam and the physician didn't want to do the exam. He cited lack of expertise as his reason for not wanting to perform the examination and that caused a whole furor in France. And um, the report said that the transgender female became abusive to the receptionists and of course it went to the press, everything goes to the press. And then there were statements that had to be made. Um, he had to justify why he didn't. And then there are persons who started speaking about the fact that, which is correct, that everybody has the right to access medical care. Um, it's called universal, I uh, can't remember what it's called right now. I'll remember in a little bit, but universal health care, universal health coverage, UHC. But everybody has the right to access health care when they need it, where they need it, in the area that they live or they work or whatever. Everybody has the right. Universal health coverage. And so this particular physician was not facilitating that goal of, of, of health. But the question is, next slide, 
how do we manage as healthcare providers? Because we have a duty of care to every person who presents to us. And this duty of care has to be balanced with our competencies and personal beliefs. Now, if some person were to collapse in front of a doctor, for example, who has not renewed his or her basic life support and is not, and is not, um, doesn't remember how to do basic CPR, then that doctor should not jump on anybody's chest trying to do something he or she is not competent to do. So looking back at the French doctor who is not competent to do a vaginal exam on a person who has had gender affirming surgery because the structure of the female vagina and the structure of the transgender vagina probably are not the same. I've never examined a transgender vagina, I don't know. Um, they're probably not the same. They probably don't respond the same in terms of using a speculum. They probably don't feel the same because they're made of different materials. So there are specialists who manage transgender examinations and so on, but patients should not be denied healthcare because of their sexual orientation and their personal preferences. But by extension, therefore, doctors should not be forced into taking care of a person with whom they have no experience for their particular condition. And such conditions go against their personal beliefs. So there needs to be clear guidance in the law as to how far does duty of care go when it comes to transgenderism. We're going to have to adjust our healthcare system to deal with these social norms, which have become different. And there is going to be the need to provide specialist trans care until it becomes, if it does, becomes more, more prevalent in society where this becomes uh, like another, no, that, that's not the right thing to say. Um, another, another situation that we have to manage, have to be very careful the, the words I choose and the words I use. So perhaps we need to start speaking about um, caring for the transgender person at the level of medical schools, as opposed to you now using hardened physicians and trying to teach them how to manage this particular population. So that's something that we have to think about as healthcare professionals. How do we go about? What are the changes that are necessary? And in truth and in fact, since continuing medical education is now a requirement for registration, is it that this is going to be part of our requirements to re-register as physicians? So this is something that we have to consider next. So we've made it to the end. Um, truth be told, this is confusing and there's a lot of confusion surrounding transgenderism. The impact of transgenderism is multi-sectoral and in the same way, the long-term long effects of transgenderism on the various sectors in society, it's going to be multiplied with time to come. What we're now seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. There are 107 gender identities listed up to October the 10th, 2023, 107. What's going to become of our economies? what is going to become of our economies with the decreasing numbers of the workforce, the segment of our population that is able to earn money and therefore um, create payment and support for those sectors in society that cannot support themselves, the very old and the very young. Let's talk about the mental health status of society that bad period in our lives just a couple months ago in Barbados, suicide after suicide. And we've seen from studies that 
the rates of mental health disorders is higher in the transgender communities, any of the any of the communities that are on the fringes of societies tend to have higher rates of mental health disorders. Next. We go back to the book. The borrower is slave to the lender. And this doesn't only apply to loans from the bank, <laughs> but we have to be so very cautious as a nation where we put our national signature. We are not privy as individuals to all of the fine print and all of the all of the dictates which come in these treaties and loans to which you know we sign our names or our names are signed for us and therefore if if to borrow this particular sum of money requires that you have gender specific gender neutral bathrooms or that you allow males to wear female clothing and females to wear male clothing as school uniforms, well, then if we use the money, we have to abide by the dictates. But the, I think the most important thing is what is the response of the church? Now, we cannot hate by virtue of what the word of God says. On the other end of the spectrum, we cannot affirm because of what the word of God says. And therefore, our response is to bring Jesus to a world that clearly needs him. Right, next slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes, good evening, um, Dr. Renee. Are Hi, you hearing me? I'm hearing you. Good evening. Yes, um, good evening to the platform as well. I, the, I, I was a little concerned with the, the picture that you showed earlier with the pregnant male. I was wondering if what he was witnessing was, was trip photography or if that was really true. Because I'm wondering how, how could how could medicine at this point be able to let's say install a uterus in a male and how could, how could they um, create the process of ovulation and whatnot that would be necessary for the production of a baby no so so medicine did not install the uterus that's a transgender male but he 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 didn't have gender affirming surgery, meaning that he still retains a uterus, ovaries, fallopian tubes. Well, that was a female that became that became a male. Yes. Trans, yes. right? So it's trans yes. transgender female. Yes, of course, because it was very concerned. transgender male, transgender male, transgender yeah, yeah. male. Well, my misunderstanding there, but um, yes, no, no yeah. problem. Okay, but, but who? So the. The partner, his partner, sorry, her <laughs> partner. <laughs> my pronouns, I'm getting mixed up with my pronouns, right? The, the partner would have been a, a dry a, queen. A, a, a male. A male. A male. Oh, a male. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Dry there, queen, there, a dry queen. There, there are many aspects to this thing, as you, as you said. Also, oh, it's yeah. female and female. Yeah, okay. So, okay. So, so essentially what we have is, and I put it in inverted commas, but what we have is a heterosexual union. Yeah, yes, but with some disguises. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Sister Phillips, yes, I see your hand. Yeah. Yes, um, I was responding to what you, the question you had asked earlier about, you know, when you were giving the statistics about um, young children that and when were, that were, were given, that were kind of given the opportunity to be transgender. Yes. And then you said, then you said that a lot of them had um, mental issues and so forth. Right, and we were looking at 
I was thinking that the reason for some of this is that a lot of the time, these children are forced into this by adults because I don't think that the children would at what, three years old gonna decide that I want to be a male. Even if they do that, it is just a play thing for them. But when they get an old, older now and, and see what's happening to them, it, it confuses them. And as a result, we ended up, they end up with mental issues. I don't know if you agree with me, but I, I, I figured that that could be one of the reasons. Well, I agree. The study had found that the children themselves in that particular group, they had found that there was already a higher incidence of things like ADHD and autism in those children. So I'm not certain of the selection process. I'm not certain of what criteria they would have used. But then even at the end, they still ended up having higher rates of um, depression and, and so on. And it's because of all the things you spoke about. And I completely agree with what you say. I, I find it difficult to believe that a child at three years old, three years old, um, is convinced that he or she wants to be a boy or a girl. I think maybe earlier it's curiosity um, and trying to figure out what makes me different from the, the boys that I know. That this is just my thinking. I'm not a psychologist. And they said by age five, by age five, 2.5% had gone back to their original gender. So 100 take away 2.5 is 97.5. So 97.5% of those children have transitioned. So, so why? What is it? What is it that has made 97% of those children transition? But it's being different. It is the impact of being on the fringes of society. It's the internal conflict. It's the external conflict that pushes these children to become victims of mental health disorders. Um, uh, Dr. Alicia, yes, I see your hand. Yes, please. One of the things I've realized in reading as well is a lot of them who do transition, as they get older, they want to detransition. They want to go back to what they originally were. And for me, a lot of this transgender move is fueled by doctors and surgeons to make money. Because if you are taking someone from, say, 13 years old, um, and changing their body structure and what's not. It takes a process. Um, it isn't just a one-time surgery. It takes a process. And it is a very expensive process. When you talk about not only the drugs, but the surgeries, it is a very expensive process. And a lot of them, after they've gone through the process and have made the change, then they've decided, you know what? I... I I want to go back to what, what I was really born as. And, and that in itself puts another mental problem into the atmosphere. Uh, just to quickly mention something, there was an article in the Times where a gentleman, he had spoken about, um, he transitioned from, from male to female, transition from male to female, and he had a wonderful community on the internet supporting him and so on, and then he became Christian. And then he detransitioned, de and he spoke about the, the violence that he experienced as a result of that, the loss of that community. And you spoke about the expense physically, um, sorry, the expense financially, but we, we have not spoken about the expense physically. These surgeries, there are, there are many of them, the healing time, no matter how your techniques have improved, there are complications to surgery. Then you have to think about the emotional expense. So they're, they're not easy surgeries to have and detransitioning is just as difficult or even more difficult. Um, any other raised hands? I see Akeem R and I see Pastor Rose. Pastor Rose? Yes, Dr. Good evening, everyone. Some questions come for the church. I don't think that we can answer them here, but it's worthy of consideration on our part. And we see the how this changes 
our approach or the things we have to consider? I know you mentioned before, as it relates to someone considering marriage, it is not now, and I don't know how much of that is it matters now to a lot of people. Um, were you or are you a, a virgin? And you said that no, the question may be, may have to be, um, were you born male or female? Um, the, the, the counselor, the person who is doing the premarital counseling, this has implications for them as well in, in terms of, of changing and some of the questions that will now be asked. That's one. And also what happens because uh, maybe a long time ago, we heard of this in the, the churches in North America and across the world where um, transgender, you know, persons were, were in the churches. What happens with us now? How do we respond when we, when we recognize one way or another that maybe a member is having a challenge um, in this area, how do we as leaders or members, how do we treat to this person? How do we engage with them? Are, are we bold enough to have a conversation with them, not a conversation which condemns them, but a conversation to understand what they're going through and to help them through um, that challenging time that, 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 they, that, they, are, that they are having? How do we do that? And then you mentioned where people want, where a male may identify, want to be identified as, as a female or vice versa. Let's go to Sunday school. What implications would that have for the Sunday school teachers and people, people's rights? So do we call them her or him? Do we ignore them? What do we do? Just full for thought. Yes. And I, when you spoke about Sunday school teachers, I remember watching a documentary where there were drag queens who were being used to teach kindergarten children how to read. They were doing the storytelling. And one of the children asks, you know, why do you look like this? And he calmly, he, yes, he calmly explained that he liked dressing like this. It was part of his job. And, and he normalized it, normalized it on an impressionable kindergarten. And you see this, no, this, this is where values and, and the, the Chinese say, you know, give me a child up to about age what six seven and then I'll give you the man so when we start impressioning I don't think that's a word but you know what I mean putting these things in the minds of our children as normal then this is the society that we're going to get back and we go back to what I said at the beginning what Karl Marx said that it's our responsibility or the responsibility of the the moral society is to you know decide what kind of society you're going to leave for your children and our thoughts as a church, our response, our actions have to be done with the type of world we want to leave for our, for our children. There's so many difficult questions because another question I can pose is we're not the ones to determine salvation. We, we can't say a person is saved or not. So let's say a person comes into our church and this person has had gender affirming surgery, but this person has um, become a Christian and doesn't have the money to go back. Is this person going to be allowed to preach and be on the worship team? You know, these, these, are, these are questions for the church. And I think that what we need as a church is to be prepared to answer questions and to be prepared to defend why we say what we say and our defense comes from the bible our defense comes from the bible so we need to be able to say why we say and this is the time where you need to know why you, why you believe what you believe so it's no matter it's no longer a matter of what um you heard growing up or whatever the answer becomes the word of god says 
And so those are just my thoughts. Um, we, we have passed the hour. So if there aren't any other, or are there any other burning questions? I saw that Akim R had had up his hand. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. The others who are uh, watching, you can just let me know if I've missed any. I just wanted to ask another question while no one is there. Um, how, how do you think, do you think that the, 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 the LGBT movement, it has a strong campaign going on right now. How do you think churches should respond to that? Sorry, how do you think our church should respond to that? Should, should, should we have a response? But this is exactly what we're saying. We, we need to respond. I, I think there's, there's a verse that became very, very clear to me recently. It says that we do not wage war in the same way that the world does. And so, so what that verse means is we wage war. We do not sit down and, and do nothing. But the difference is how we wage war. And that is where we as a church, and that's the question we're asking. We don't have the answers yet. We know what we believe. We know what the Bible says about what we believe. And therefore, what is our response going to be? Because remember, I said we can't hate. We cannot hate because we are commanded to love. That's what the Bible says. However, we cannot affirm transgenderism, homosexuality, and all the other 107 identities that there are simply because the Bible says in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, God created male and female. Therefore, um, we can't affirm. So we have to say what our plan is. Our our, we have to come with a unified response. So therefore, what is taught at Salters is the same thing that is taught in, in Jackson, in Crab Hill, and so on and so forth, so that every member is built up and able to respond. Because it can't just be one person here or one person there. That's not effective. The body has to be able to respond. Um, so I saw something here in the chat from Overcomer, which, which is... a uh, almost a response to what I said. The, the person said, what would the Bible say about transgender coming to Christ and on the worship team or preaching? So the Bible says, any man in Christ is a new creature. And the Bible also says, we are not supposed to despise people because of a day or because of what they eat or because of a particular thing. So what, what is the answer? I don't have all the answers. But do you think the response of the church, the position of the church should be known publicly or, or, or between churches? When you say publicly, meaning that do, you, do I think that the Church of God Reformation Movement, even although we said that there's no such entity, but the Church of God Reformation Movement should go out and on a particular platform say this is our stance against transgenderism. The time is coming when we will have to do that but we would need to have a proper response. Okay. Right, and I see a very valid point um, because remember the church has a constitution and what does our constitution say about this? And of course, what our constitution says cannot go against what the Bible says because ultimately the, the last point of reference, the first point of reference and the last point of reference is the Bible. So we need, I'm, I'm sure that there, there are lots of people out there. I'm not even fully aware of what is in our constitution. So there must be, again, a, a reteaching or teaching of, of what's in our constitution, why we believe what we believe. This is something that has to be ongoing. And then we have to come up with, and I'm very hesitant to say we should have a committee to to respond to this, but certainly there has to be some sort of task force to respond to this particular issue. Because we cannot, we cannot be ill-informed. Somewhere in the Bible it says, brothers, I wouldn't, I would have you to 
what was it say now? Um, I would not have you to be ill-informed about this particular issue, something along those those lines. You know, don't don't be ignorant about this particular thing. We cannot, we can't bury our can't bury our heads in the sand. We can't because the the future that we're leaving for our children, the world that we're leaving for our children depends on a response. It, de it depends on the correct response done in the correct way whatever you do you must do it in love so we're not going to go there and brandish people and call them all sorts of things i remember in some of the points that i made i said that the, there is just equal justification like the use of hormones causing trouble on fetuses this can happen in in non-transgender people so we have to be able to defend and back up every single thing that we say and i sorry i see something else in the chat that's very relevant I understand that we are getting down in time, you know, you have to go to work tomorrow. Um, so this person said a lot of churches are breaking down because of this topic. And this is true. This is one of those topical issues that's causing people to leave the church, it's causing churches to be split apart. So we have to know what we believe, why we believe it and, and defend it. So Pastor Alicia, this is going to be our last question. And remember, we do have another two sessions coming and there's one at the end, which is, Pastor Jackman's session, I believe, about, um, about dealing with those difficult questions. So certainly questions from tonight should be fed into that session um, coming up in two weeks' time. Pastor yeah. Alicia? This is Pastor Carrington's session. But um, oh, sorry, Pastor Carrington, my, my apologies. <laughs> yeah, the word says my people perish for lack of knowledge. And as a church, we have to be aware of the various legislations as well that are being imposed on our nation. Over the last few years, we know we've had um, the 30, when voting was done, the Barbados Labour Party has 30 seats. And so in Parliament, a lot of laws and legislations are being passed because we have no opposition. And as a people, we, we may just see parliament come on tv but we we need to truly pay attention to some of the legislation that is being um spewed or the legislation that is out there because it too can have a significant impact on what we as the church speak we need to continue to speak truth and as you said the word of god has to be our standard and so we need to speak truth. And as we speak truth, a lot of these legislations and laws will seek to offset the truth that we speak, but we need to stand and speak truth. Yeah, and the, I think my final point will be that I believe the body of Christ is fully resourced for any response that we have to make. Within the body of Christ, we have intelligent human beings. We have people who have professional qualifications and we have people who are good at looking at situations and and breaking them down so a person might not necessarily have a law degree but he or she is able to look at societal issues and and be able to shed light on certain things that uh, a person who has a particular degree for example and i just chose law it could be any degree it could be sociology medicine whatever so the body of christ has within it whatever it needs to respond to this particular issue it's just a matter of us coming together let divisions be forsaken and all the holy join in one and the will of God in all be done. Um, it really was my pleasure uh, hosting this evening session and I'm very glad that I was able to provoke some thought. I do hope that the information that I shared has been beneficial and that it has opened up your eyes to some things that we need to act upon and things that we need to start clarifying for ourselves. And I look forward to where the church goes with the response to this issue of homosexuality and transgenderism. And if afterward you can think of anything that you wanted to ask me, you can, you all know how to find me. <laughs> uh, but my email address is Renee S T Boyce. I'll put it in the chat for anybody that wants it. And I will try to respond to your emails to clarify anything that I might have said. So do have a pleasant night, have a productive day tomorrow, whatever you do, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. Good night, everyone.